the main event, written by Rodney Riesel, narrated by Alex Zahn. Chapter One Alan Crane pulled into York Beach around noon on August 23rd. It was a Sunday. Two days earlier, the weather report predicted a washout, but that wasn't the case at all. A few puffy white clouds dotted the sky. It was sunny and warm. He was surprised by the amount of traffic and the amount of people. He lowered his window in anticipation of the aroma of fresh salt air. He breathed in deeply. There was no salty smell, just the odor of dead fish. The brake lights in front of him came on, and traffic came to a standstill. Alan went ahead and lowered the rest of the windows in the old black Cherokee. Frankie was asleep on the back seat, but he opened his eyes when he heard the hum of the window motor. His eyes slowly closed again, and a seagull cried out. Frankie was on his feet with his head out the window in an instant. Two seagulls were on the sidewalk fighting over a dead crab. Frankie let out a low, quiet growl, followed by a few loud barks as he fixed them in a piercing stare. Quiet down, Frankie, Alan commanded. The dog barked once more for good measure. He turned and stuck his head between the front seats. Always got to get in the last word, don't you? He reached up and scratched the old dog on the head. The red Mustang with Massachusetts plates moved ahead about three feet and stopped again. Alan did the same. Why did I leave so early? He wondered as he inched along York Street. It was less than a five-hour drive from his hometown of Herkimer, New York, and check-in wasn't until three. What are we going to do for three hours, pal? The Mustang rolled forward again, and Alan took his foot off the brake. He gazed out over the water. He could see the Nubble Lighthouse off in the distance now. His eyes returned to the road. Jesus Christ! He hollered, slamming on his brakes and driving Frankie's chin into the console. Luckily, he had brought the jeep to a halt about two inches from the Mustang. Frankie managed to get back on his feet again. You okay? Sorry about that. Guess I better keep my eyes on the road. Frankie glared at his master. I said I was sorry. Alan fiddled with the radio and settled on a country station. Kenny Chesney was singing Happy Does. He tapped his thumbs on the steering wheel. I should try to write a song, he thought. How hard can it be? If I can write a book, I should be able to write a song. Of course, I can't sing or play an instrument. I guess someone else could sing, and I could just tap my thumbs on the steering wheel. The next time the cars moved ahead, it was about 20 feet. Alan hoped that was a good sign. Lobster Cove, he read aloud. We ate there last time we were here. He thought for a second. What was that, seven years now? Wow, that went fast. That was before your time, pal. They had a great breakfast. We ate there two mornings in a row. They had a lobster eggs benedict. Wonder if they still have it. Maybe we'll check it out tomorrow morning. The line was moving at six miles per hour now, and Alan hadn't touched the brake pedal in at least fifteen seconds. Just as he was about to get a little too excited, the Mustang's brake lights lit again. Damn it! Three ladies on bicycles whizzed by. Should have rode my bike, I would have made better time. A long-haired kid rode his skateboard on the sidewalk past the No Skateboarding on Sidewalk sign. Eh, he probably won't be reading one of my books, Alan mumbled under his breath. He looked over at Frankie. The dog was sound asleep in the back seat again. Why don't you drive, Frankie, and I'll sleep for a while? When he reached the corner of Tabernacle Road, Alan could see the Sunrise Motel sign. 
A block to go, Frankie. The dog lifted his head for a second, more in annoyance than curiosity, and dropped it back to the leather seat. The traffic began moving faster, and the Mustang stepped on it. The driver honked at a woman pushing a stroller in the sidewalk and swerved around her. Masshole, Alan grumbled and brought his vehicle to a stop, letting the woman cross. The thirty-something brunette smiled and gave a half-wave. Alan nodded. He waited as the same long-haired kid skateboarded into the crosswalk behind the woman. The kid didn't wave or give any other gesture of thanks. He hopped off the skateboard halfway across the street and carried it the rest of the way. Mom, Alan heard the kid say, but the rest was inaudible. Alan gave the jeep some gas and took a left into the parking lot. The Sunrise Motel was a motel in every sense of the word. There was a parking lot, and all of the twenty-four guest rooms entered from the outside. This particular motel was L-shaped, and twenty of the rooms being on the three-story long side of the L facing the ocean, and the remaining four rooms on the two-story shorter side. The office was on the first floor, tucked into the corner where the two sections of rooms met. The doors and window frames were painted yellow, the walls, trim, and railings were white. Alan backed into a parking space at the far side of the lot, shut off his engine, and climbed out of his vehicle. He reached back inside and grabbed the leash from the passenger seat. "'Come on, Frankie,' he said, opening the back door. Frankie jumped to the blacktop and stayed near Alan, waiting to have his leash clipped to his collar. Once leashed, Alan walked the dog to the rear of the jeep, to a fifty-by-fifty 50 50 grassy area bordered on two sides by the parking lot and on the other two sides by streets. "'Looks like the perfect place to take a dump,' said Alan. Frankie couldn't concentrate on anything but the gulls on the sidewalk across the street. He barked and stared them down. Quiet down, dog. We'll be here for the next two weeks, and I'm not going to want to hear you barking at those damn birds the whole time. When Alan had adopted Frankie from a shelter, he was told Frankie was a Heinz 57, a conglomeration of several unidentified breeds. In other words, a good old-fashioned mutt. Alan considered this the best kind of dog. The shelter people thought Frankie had some border collie in the mix. The dog's intelligence, sweetness, and easy trainability bore this out, although it was hard to detect any physical evidence of the breed in Frankie's shaggy black-and-white coat, which reminded Alan of the love child of Chewbacca and Bigfoot. Fortunately, Frankie did not have a herding dog's hyper-energetic workaholic nature, he was more laid back, which was a compliment to Alan's mostly sedentary rider lifestyle. He did, though, have the Border Collie's herding eye, an intense stare he reserved for birds for some reason. Frankie's strange bird fixation was a peccadillo Alan had learned to live with. Alan tugged at the leash. Shit or get off the pot, pal. Frankie lifted his leg and peed. He scratched at the grass with his back feet. It ain't a litter box, dog. Alan raised his arms over his head, stretched and yawned. He scanned the horizon, his focus eventually settling on a backhoe sitting on a massive mound of dirt between the sidewalk and the rocky beach. White plastic sawhorses and orange cones sat on the sidewalk and curb, restricting access to a 100-foot section of the sidewalk and beach. Yellow plastic tape was strung between the sawhorses. There was also a bulldozer 30 feet south of the backhoe. Being Sunday, there were no workers. I wonder what they're doing over there, Alan asked no one in particular. I wonder how loud that's going to be all day. As Alan turned back toward the motel, a thin woman with short gray hair caught his eye. 
She was standing in front of a door to the left of a soda machine. Come on, let's go talk to this lady. Alan and Frankie crossed the parking lot toward the old woman. You the manager? Housekeeping, the woman replied, her voice a crow-like rasp from the smoke of a million cigarettes. She coughed and spit a yellowish-green chunk of lung three feet to the parking lot. Nice, Alan thought. Is the manager around? The wrinkled hag nodded her head in the direction of the office. What's the sign say? Alan gazed at the red neon sign. Vacancy? Not that one, the one on the door. Alan squinted to see the writing on a piece of computer paper that had been taped to the glass panel in the door. I can't read it from here. I can get your wheelchair out of your jeep for you and wheel you closer. I don't have a wheelchair. Then walk your ass over there and read it. The old woman turned, opened the door she was standing in front of, and went inside. Alan looked down at his dog. Now that's what I call hospitality, boy. He deadpanned. He heard a door slam behind him and turned to see the long-haired boy coming out of a room in the first floor. He dropped his skateboard to the blacktop, hopped on it, and sped away. Alan watched as a kid crossed the street and jumped the curb. The door the boy had exited, room number four, swung open. The woman who had crossed the street with the stroller stepped out onto the porch. She had a baby on her hip. Jacob! The woman hollered. Alan knew the boy could hear her. Everyone in York Beach probably heard her. Jacob Palmer! A few seconds later, Jacob rolled out of sight. The woman looked at Alan and shook her head. Selective hearing, Alan called out. So it seems, the woman responded. She stepped back into the room and shut the door. Let's go read that sign, Frankie. As Alan and Frankie neared the office door, the words on the sheet of paper came into focus. Manager on duty from one to nine, it said in pencil. No manager till one can't check in till three. What do you think, boy? Should we take a walk up the street and see what's going on? Frankie didn't object, so off they went. They crossed the street and stepped onto the sidewalk. What do you think? Alan asked the dog. First time seeing the ocean? Alan knew it was the dog's first time. It was the first time Frankie had been more than 50 miles from home. Frankie was incarcerated at the Herkimer County Humane Society when he and Alan first met. Get a dog, several of his friends told him. It'll take your mind off things. None of Alan's friends had ever lost a spouse, so he wondered how they knew a dog would take his mind off things. But eventually he figured he'd give it a try. They were wrong. They meant well, but they were wrong. The dog didn't take his mind off anything. Rum took his mind off things. Scotch took his mind off things. Tequila and whiskey also worked pretty well. As far as the dog was concerned, it was nice to have him around the house. It was nice having someone to talk to, even if Frankie never talked back. While standing on the sidewalk overlooking the water, Alan realized that the heavy machinery and sawhorse barricade were part of the ongoing construction of a stepped concrete seawall. The finished section of the seawall ended right in front of the Sunrise Motel. He knew the workers would probably be back at it in the morning and thought of construction noise entered his head again. He wondered how early they started in the morning. He wondered if he'd be able to sleep. He wondered if he'd be able to nap in the afternoon after riding. He also wondered how much something like this must cost. Frankie's bark brought him out of his daydream. He looked down at the dog. What did I say about barking at seagulls? He asked. He gave the leash a slight yank. Come on. 
Alan and Frankie strolled along Long Beach Avenue, people watching and gull watching. Every parking space along the avenue was taken. There were SUVs with paddle boards, kayaks, and surfboards strapped to their roofs. There were old beat-up junkers and brand-new Porsches. There were small RVs and larger ones that took up two spaces. There were motorcycles, mopeds, and scooters squeezed in between other vehicles. The two passed vacationer after vacationer, tourist after tourist. Alan nodded and said, How you doing today, and how's it going, to many of them as he passed them by. Everyone he spoke to was a lot friendlier than the housekeeper. At the Sun and Surf restaurant, Alan and Frankie switched to the other side of the street. Alan inspected the many beach houses along the way, even commenting several times that maybe he and Frankie should have rented a house instead of staying at an old motel. Most of the houses that sat on Long Beach Avenue were nothing fancy. It looked to Alan as though most of the old properties hadn't had any improvements made since the last time he visited. A good percentage of the million-dollar homes were in worse shape than his hundred-thousand-dollar place back home. Location, location, location. Hey, this place serves breakfast, said Alan. He stopped in front of the Oceanside store, looking up at the long sign that was mounted to the roof and stretched from one end of the building to the other. The Oceanside store is more of a diner than a store. There were a few groceries inside and some other things a vacationer at the beach might need, like beach towels, sunscreen, batteries, chips, soda, candy, souvenir mugs, and what not. Inside, to the left of the door, was a counter to order and pay for food. To the right of the door were several coffee machines. There was also a service counter out front. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Alan read. Maybe we should try this place in the morning. Alan looked back over his shoulder at the ocean. Nice view. His eyes went back to the diners seated at the two picnic tables. They seemed to be enjoying the food. Alan gave the leash a gentle tug, and the two were on their way. He checked his watch. We could have eaten lunch there, but I didn't see anyone drinking alcohol. I could use a drink. As they passed the Liquid Dreams surf shop, Alan commented, Maybe we should take surfing lessons, Frankie. What do you think? A blonde kid with a crew cut was sitting on a wooden bench out front of the surf shop. He was bare-chested with his black and blue wetsuit folded over at the waist and the arms dangling off the edge of the bench. His surfboard lay across his lap, and he was giving it a thorough waxing. The kid overheard Alan and said, hey, We can do that. We do private lessons. He reached around behind him and fiddled with the zipper of his wetsuit. How much? I'm around a hundred bucks. What do I do, make an appointment? Yeah, just call up a day or two ahead and we'll fit you in. Maybe I'll do that. Thanks. No problem, dude, but you'll have to teach the dog after you learn how. Alan looked down at the mutt. You hear that, Frankie? Don't worry, pal. I'll give you the family discount. The kid laughed and returned to his waxing. Come on, boy. Stone's Throw was the next place they stopped. Alan checked his wristwatch. Yeah, it's time for lunch, he said. Stone's Throw. Drink, eat, stay, he read aloud. Two out of three ain't bad. Alan stepped up to the hostess station. Good afternoon, said the young woman. She reached up and tucked her long brown hair behind her ear. How many? Uh, just me and the dog, Alan replied. Is there a table available outside? The hostess looked down at her laminated table sheet. Is next door okay? Alan looked to his left at the deck on stilts attached to the end of the two-story Stone's Throw Motel. Didn't even know there was a next door, he said. But sure, that would be fine. 
The young woman, whose name tag read Maya, scratched out one of the two tops on the table sheet and said, Right this way. She picked up a menu as she walked around the podium. Alan followed her across the alley, onto a brick sidewalk, and up the stairs. She led him to his table, and he sat down, facing the water. Behind him was the motel. The decking was gray composite. The railing posts were covered in white vinyl. The railings were thin steel cables. Maya bent down and scratched Frankie's head. Beautiful dog, she said. Well, he's a dog supermodel, so is he really? No, Frankie's just a regular dog model and an actor. Seriously? Yeah, you've probably seen him in a few commercials. Oh, my God, what ones? Let's see, there was the one for Gullible Hostesses Anonymous. He was also in Very Funny. Maya was grinning at the same time, trying to look angry. I'm just joking with you. He's actually never had a call back. Maya rose and put her hands on her hips. Are you finished? I had a few more, but we can do it tomorrow. I'm off tomorrow. Your loss, it was going to be some really funny shit. Maya just shook her head and turned back toward the steps. Before she ascended, she looked back over her shoulder. Alan gave her a big grin. Purposefully, too big. Alan noticed a table of college guys to his right, staring at Maya as she crossed the deck. They were the only other customers on the deck. One said something, but Alan couldn't hear what it was. It was obviously hilarious based on the other four's reaction. One of the kids looked over at Alan. Alan nodded. The kid nodded back. Looks like everyone loves Maya, Alan said, mostly to himself. He crossed his legs and picked up the menu as he leaned back in his chair. Another nice view, he said to the dog. Welcome to Stone's Throw, said a tall, skinny twenty-something with a man bun and black, thick-rimmed glasses. Welcome to my table, Alan replied. Can I start you off with something to drink? Alan quickly scanned the cocktails. Mm, yeah, I, uh, I'll have one of these painkillers. Good choice. Is booze ever a bad choice? The kid chuckled. I guess not. Oh, and some water for Frankie. The kid glanced down at the panting dog. Of course. He turned and then spun back around. I'm Cal, by the way. I'm Alan. Cal walked into the building through a set of glass French doors at the rear of the deck. Alan looked up over the doorway at a second-floor deck. There were no tables on that deck, only white plastic lounge chairs and a couple of end tables. There were stairs leading from the lower deck to the upper deck. Underneath the stairs was a door that said, Restroom. You think you can hang here for a second, pal? Alan asked. I gotta hit the head. Frankie's eyes were closed. So that's a yes. Alan got up, crossed the deck, and pulled open the door. He was a little startled to see two men already standing in the small four-foot-by-five-foot restroom. One of the men, the larger of the two, was about Alan's height, almost six feet, but about a hundred pounds heavier. He clutched the front of the other guy's T-shirt in his right fist and had him backed up against the sink. His stubbled face was red. The other guy looked nervous, but not really scared. The smaller guy was bald and had a scar under his right eye. "'What the hell do you want?' the bigger guy demanded and brought up his left forearm to halt Alan. Alan grinned. "'I just needed to pee.' We're in here. I see that. Alan glanced down at the deadbolt. If you turn this knob, no one will disturb you and whoever this guy is. The goon released his grip on the smaller guy and reached for Alan. He had fire in his eyes. You smart mouth. 
Alan took a step back, and when the guy's arm cleared the doorway, he swung it closed as hard as he could on the angry man's bicep. Ah! the guy cried out. Alan smacked the bottom of the door with the toe of his sneaker and, with very little effort, wedged it into place. The guy was moving his hand around in every direction and opening and closing his fist, trying to grab hold of Alan. Open the door, the guy hollered. God damn it! Calm down and I'll let you out, Alan responded. If not, I can stay in here all day. You son of a bitch! Sticks and stones, said Alan. He looked to his left at the college guys. They didn't know what to think. I'll rip you apart! Threats will only lead to more pain, Alan warned, and then threw his shoulder into the door. The big guy cried out again. Excuse me, sir, said the waiter. Yes, Cal. Were you ready to order? I haven't looked at the menu yet. I have your drink. In his other hand, Cal held a bowl of water. Fantastic. Can you just hold a straw up to my mouth so I can take a sip? Cal did as he was asked. Alan took a long sip. Oh, that's good, Cal. Did you make that? <laughs> yes, I did, Cal said proudly. The man with his arm stuck in the door continued to scream threats and obscenities as Cal and Alan conversed. Quiet down, Alan hollered and hit the door with his shoulder again. This guy is so rude. Are you going to let him out of the restroom, sir? As soon as he settles down... Can you put my drink on the table and grab the menu, please? Cal walked the five steps to Alan's table. He placed the drink on the table, the bowl in front of a still sleeping Frankie, and picked up the menu. I swear to God, the rowdy yelled, when I get out of here, I'm going to rip your head off. Alan looked at Cal and rolled his eyes. Oh, hold the menu up so I can read it, please. Cal held it up to Alan's face. Back it up there a bit, Cal. I'm not a young man anymore, and I left my reading glasses in the car. Cal pulled back the menu, and Alan looked it over. I'll just have an order of those wings. Great choice, said Cal, and he once again disappeared through the French doors. Alan returned his attention to the arm. If you want me to release the door, all I have to do is promise not to touch me. The guy was silent for a few seconds, and then Alan heard the two men whispering. He put his ear closer to the door, but couldn't make out what they were saying. It's not nice to whisper, Alan said. It makes others feel left out. Okay, let me out, the guy said calmly. I won't touch you. You promise? I promise. And? And what? I think you owe me an apology. I'm sorry the guy said, obviously through clenched teeth. Now see, that wasn't so hard, was it? Alan released his toehold on the door and readied himself for what he knew was a phony apology. The ruffian shoved open the door with both hands. It slammed against the wall behind it. The guy may have looked angry before, but it was nothing compared to the look on his face when he stepped out of the restroom. His eyes bulged, his face was almost as red as his eyes, and a massive vein protruded from the center of his forehead. A single drop of sweat ran from above his left eye, around the brow, and down his cheek. He took one step toward Alan, froze, and grabbed his chest. Alan stepped aside as the three-hundred-pounder toppled forward and hit the deck, face first, the entire lower deck shook, waking Frankie. The dog jumped to his feet. Alan glanced over at Maya, who was just then bringing a party of four up the steps and onto the deck. She looked at Alan and then down at the guy on the deck. "'Looks like you just missed the show, folks,' said Maya. "'Today's act was a supermodel dog and his comedian owner. Some real funny shit. Should we call 911?' One of the ladies in the group asked, "'Probably be a good idea,' Maya replied. The second man stepped out of the restroom. He stared down at the unconscious man. "'The boss ain't gonna like this,' he said, straightening the front of his T-shirt. "'Nope, 
He ain't going to like this at all. Cow, Alan hollered through the French doors. Can I get those wings to go? sunrises and clothes falling off and how she drives you crazy along with that stuff so when the blues come knocking and getting you down it's time to let Brooks and Dunn take you to Tequila Town it might be one of those times you win Gotta stay strong There's a reason Everybody's got a tequila song When you find out she's cheap On some afternoon It's time to head down To your favorite saloon You may not know it yet But you'll find out real soon there's a reason everybody's got a tequila too It might be one of those times you ain't getting along Or maybe one better she went and done you wrong Whatever that old reason You gotta stay strong there's a reason everybody's got a tequila song Yeah, tequila may love you even if she don't And ten rounds will get you through even if she won't You need some quibble if she ain't doing you right Where are Tequila talking on the street to keep you Everybody's got a tequila song 